Good morning, church. <laughs> Welcome into the house of the Lord as we gather together on this first Sunday of the season of Advent, the season we prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ into this world. And, um, you know, we are still kind of in that, that aftermath um, of, of Thanksgiving. And uh, in, I don't know about your family, but in our family, we're always very careful about not mixing together Thanksgiving and Christmas too much. Uh, in fact, it's our oldest daughter, Hannah, that is absolutely adamant that, uh, that we cannot do anything for Christmas before Thanksgiving, uh, other than maybe shop for presents for her or something like that. But, um, but no decorating, no decorating, no Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving because she doesn't want Thanksgiving to be overlooked. It is an often uh, overlooked holiday, but, you know, we have made that transition now from Thanksgiving into this Christmas season. And it reminds me a little bit about the, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? Before it was a walking stage show of lip-syncing celebrities, um, there was actually a theme to the, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. If you notice, the parade starts with the float of Tom the Turkey, right? Because it's, it's Thanksgiving Day. And so we're celebrating Thanksgiving. It's a reminder of that season. But the parade ends with Santa Claus uh, coming in his sleigh as a reminder of the changing of the season from Thanksgiving to, to Christmas. So we are moving beyond the celebration of Thanksgiving, and I do hope, by the way, that you took some time, that you intentionally took some time last week to maybe list out the blessings that God has given you. Uh, I, I really pray that you took time to thank God for those blessings, because that act of thanking God is so important for us in becoming the people that God has called us to be. I mean, even Jesus in the Gospels takes time to thank and praise his Father for his blessings. We have recordings of him, or a recording in the Gospels of him praying, I thank God uh, for that you are the God who hears me as he stands at the grave of Lazarus. I mean, Jesus in his own prayers models this idea of thanksgiving. And if Jesus is giving thanks to his Father, that's something that we should do as well. So like I said, it's really important. Uh, even as you go through this Advent and Christmas season, Make sure you take time to thank God uh, for the blessings that he's given you. So we are turning the celebrations now. We are moving into the last great celebration of the year where we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate his coming into this world. We celebrate uh, all the things that he fulfilled as he came into this world, how he was the light in the darkness, uh, the light of the world coming in. He was the light for the, the Gentiles, the hope of salvation. We talk about all these things that he fulfilled uh, that had been prepared hundreds of years ahead of time. And then we talk about all the things that he does for us, what his birth really means for us. So now that we are moving into the Christmas season, I got to tell you that this is the, the time of year that I get asked the one question that I hate more than any other question. What do you want for Christmas? I hate that question. Anyone else hate that question? I hate that question. I, and it, it's because, you know, I, first of all, you don't want to sound greedy, right? In, in answering it, you know, you're, you're, it, it, it automatically puts you into this calculation in your mind. Okay, what can I ask for? And it doesn't sound too bad, but I actually might have a chance of getting it. You know, yeah. It brings up that whole calculation thing. I just hate that. And it makes me feel like Christmas is materialistic, that it's all about the gifts, you know? And, and, and it's kind of a sad place to be that Christmas has become so much about the gifts, about the presents. And yet the irony of it is that Christmas is actually about the gifts. Isn't that strange? But it's not about the materialistic gifts before you think I've lost my mind. I may have, but not for this. Uh, Christmas is not about the materialistic gifts that we get. Christmas is about the gifts that we get from God. The best Christmas gifts of all. The gifts that he gave us wrapped in the swaddling clothes and laying in the manger in Bethlehem. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what we're celebrating. Those are the presents that we should be focusing on. So when people ask us, what do you want for Christmas? That's, that's our answer. It's what Christ gives us as he comes into this world. And, and as we go through the season of Advent, we're going to look at what it is that, that Jesus gives to us as he comes into this world. What does it mean that Christ was born that, that silent night in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago? What does that mean for us? What are we truly given in the birth of Christ? 
And so the first theme that we're going to look at here this morning, the first gift that God gives us, uh, is the gift of, of hope. That's what our Advent reading was about, this gift of, of hope that he gives us. And I want to share with you a scripture reading this morning that uh, we're going to do something a little bit different as we go through Advent. This is going to be our scripture reading throughout this season of Advent. Every Sunday, we're going to come back to this same passage because all the gifts that God gives us are listed here in this passage. Every single one of the themes of Advent is here in this passage as Paul talks about what the life, the birth and the life and the death of Jesus mean for us as followers of Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you to take your Bibles and open up to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And we're going to look at Romans 5, 1 through 11. And for those of you who are in the Unity class, no, I am not looking at your Sunday school material. I get accused of this every week. This is just what God put on my heart because they're, they're studying Romans 5 right now. It's amazing how God will bring these things up over and over again in different situations where there are messages that we need to hear. So Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. You know, in this passage that we are going to be looking at over the next few weeks, Paul is writing to us about the new relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. And the last verse sums up all 11 of these verses, all three of these paragraphs, if you look at what Paul is writing here in, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. When you get to the last verse, the summary of his argument up to that point is he talks about the difference that the, the, the life and death of, of Jesus makes for us, as he talks about this changed relationship that we have, as he talks about what difference that changed relationship makes as we deal with the trials and troubles of life. You get to the very end, verse 11, the absolute summary of what he tells us is here. So now we can rejoice with the one, in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. That's what this is all about. This is what the birth, the life, the death of Jesus, his coming into this world means for us. That he has restored us to make us friends with God. In other words, we had a broken relationship with God. He lovingly created us and we blew it. He created us to be in this perfect relationship with him and we chose to love ourselves instead. And so Paul tells us that through Jesus, we now have an opportunity for this relationship to be restored. And he refers to this in this passage. If you go back then and look at what he says about hope, he refers to this hope of this restored relationship as our hope of salvation in verse 4. That this is our hope of salvation. And this is a hope that will not disappoint us. It will not let us down. It will not fail us. 
that Jesus offers us a way to fix this broken relationship. This hope that we have is for a new, restored, and right relationship of God. That when we were created to be in love with God, but instead we loved ourselves, and when we were, cho- when we were created to, to choose to serve God, and instead we chose to serve sin in our lives, we broke that relationship. We, we betrayed God. We turned our back on Him. And because of our choice, because of our sin, this world that he has created is less than what it should be. You know, all the times that you look around in the world and you wonder, what in the world has gotten into people? What is wrong with people in this world? Well, it's sin. That's what's wrong with this world. It's sin. We live for sin. We live for ourselves. We live for our own desires. We live for our own acceptance. We live for our own pleasure and happiness rather than living for God who created us. And so what's wrong with this world is us. It's sin. It's that broken relationship. But Christ comes into the world to restore it, to fix it, to take away our sin, to break that enslavement that we have to sin. Because, you know, Paul talks about earlier in this book of Romans that without Christ, even the things that we want to do for good end up being done for selfish reasons. You know, we try to do good, we try to put on a good face, but really it's done in order to impress other people. In order to make them think better of us, to think how good we are. And so even our good acts end up being acts of selfishness. They just serve ourselves. And we can't get out of that cycle. We can't break that cycle. Everything we do ends up serving ourselves rather than God. It's what Paul refers to as our our flesh, our enslavement to our flesh, to our sinful nature. We are hopelessly stuck in that situation until God gives us the gift of hope. This child wrapped in the manger in Bethlehem is a chance for something new, a new start, a way to break the cycle. It's a way for us to be restored, forgiven, made innocent again. Jesus gives us that in the manger of Bethlehem. Every single one of us is hopelessly stuck until we believe in Christ. Every single one of us is hopelessly serving ourselves, living for ourselves until we make that decision to follow Jesus. And when we make that decision, those chains are broken. We are set free. That now we can live in this new right restored relationship with God. And we'll live in that right relationship with God for all of eternity as it stretches out in front of us. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. That's the hope that he gives us as we come through this Advent season and get ready for Christmas. When we look at that baby in the manger on on Christmas Eve and Christmas morning as we're celebrating together here in church, As we think about that, the significance of that day, of that celebration, is not about the presence, remember, it is about the hope that God gives us in Christ for that restored and right relationship with our Father. But you know what? It's not just a hope for someday out in the future, right? This faith that we have, this gift that we've been given, is not a life insurance policy, you know, the life insurance policy that you, you pay into it, and eventually, on the day that you die, then it becomes activated and your family gets that. You know, it's, it's not something that becomes active once we die. This faith, this hope that we have is not just something for eternity, for after this world, for when we pass out of this world and we go on to be with Jesus. The hope that we have that Paul talks about in this passage is for right now, for the situations that we're dealing with right now in this world. Go back and look at verses 4 and 5 and 6 as Paul is talking about the trials and troubles that we deal with in this world. We have hope in the midst of those things right now in this world because Jesus has come into this world. Because God has given us hope through him. So when we're facing 
trials and troubles, when we're facing disappointments in life, when we're facing struggles, whether they're struggles with our relationships, when we're facing struggles with health situations, when we're facing struggles with financial situations, when we're facing struggles with, with disappointments in life, when we're facing struggles for uh, the price of following Jesus in this world compared to going along with everyone else, God gives us hope in the midst of those struggles, right now in the middle of the battle. Because you see, there's something really deceptive that happens with with struggles and with, with trials in this world. Our enemy likes to take those struggles and trials and tell us that they're never going to get any better. That life is never going to get any better. You're stuck with this situation. Your financial situation will never get any better. Your feeling of hopelessness, helplessness, your lack of self-worth, it's never going to get any better. You're born nothing, you will die nothing. Your relationships that are broken, they're never going to be healed. That's what the enemy whispers to us all the time. We get stuck in this thinking that we are in despair, that, that nothing will ever get any better for us. But Paul tells us here that our hope does not disappoint. It does not let us down. And in the midst of the struggles and the trials, we can have endurance, we can develop character, and our character is going to carry us through. Our faithfulness to Christ is going to carry us through the struggles that we're dealing with. And when we trust in him, we'll have victory on the other side. There is no battle that is going to last forever. Did you hear that, church? There is no disappointment that is going to be a dark cloud over your life forever. There is no failure that is going to define you out into your future. Christ gives us hope. You know, there's a popular Christian song on the radio right now that says, uh, let me get this right. It says, if your story, if your story isn't over, your story is never over if your story isn't good. That's the way the line goes. Your story is never over if your story isn't good. Isn't that wonderful? And it's all because of what God does for us. We have victory in the midst of the world. There is no trial that is greater than the strength of God. There is no trouble that we face that he hasn't overcome. I mean, think of the promise of Jesus in John chapter 16, that that we will have troubles and trials in this world, but he has overcome the world. His life, his death, his resurrection, they prove that he has overcome the troubles and trials of this world. So our hope is not just for someday by and by. When we leave this world, when we throw off this mortar coil, he's not just our hope for glory in the future, way down the line into eternity. Jesus is offering you hope right now. Right now. Whatever disappointment you may be dealing with, whatever struggle, whatever trial you're dealing with, he's your hope of glory now. And he's a hope that does not disappoint. He promises in his word, he will not leave you, and he will not forsake you. So my friends, this morning as we begin this season of Advent together, as we begin preparing our hearts for the coming of Jesus into this world, I want to encourage you to trust this morning. Trust God. Maybe for some of you here this morning, you've never made that decision before. You've never really decided that you're going to trust God. You think he's this great idea, good teacher, but you don't know if you really want to to trust him with your life. I want you to know he will not let you down. He's not going to disappoint you. No matter what trial you're facing, no matter what disappointment you're dealing with, he's not going to let you down. You can make that decision this morning to follow after him. You can make that decision this morning to give your life to him. And he is going to come in and he's going to flood your life with hope. Your situations may not event you know, may not instantly change, but they will eventually change. 
because of his presence in your life. Your story isn't over if your story isn't good. He's not finished with you yet. So if you haven't trusted him yet, we're going to have a time of prayer after the service or after the, the sermon this morning. And you're welcome to make that commitment to him. Now, if you have already, you know that you're not done with the trials and troubles in this world, right? We're all facing them. I want to encourage you to keep trusting him. He is our hope. And not just for someday by and by. He's your hope right now. He can give you hope in the middle of the battle. He can give you victory if we trust in him and walk in faithfulness. That's part of the good news of Christmas that we can share with this world around us. So let's take that hope. Let's walk in that confident trust of who Jesus is and his faithfulness. And let's take that out into the world this morning. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the hope that you give us in Jesus Christ. Lord, for those here this morning who have never made that decision to follow Jesus, Lord, I just pray that they would open up their hearts to you here today, that they would receive your hope filling them. Lord, that they would invite you in, give you everything of their life. And Lord, I pray that you would fill them with your hope. For those of us who have walked in your ways, for those of us who are in the middle of battles and struggles in this world, the trials and troubles that you promised would come, Lord, we thank you for the hope that you give. We thank you that we have victory through Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that you are not finished with us. In fact, you are the God who has promised good things for our lives. You've promised us a hope in the future. And Lord, we praise you and thank you for that. We praise you and thank you that you are the God who walks with us in the middle of the struggles. And there is nothing in this world, nothing, in this world that can separate us from your great love. Lord, may that hope fill us. May we walk in confident trust, not in arrogance, Lord, not in despair, but in confident trust that your presence is with us and that you're going to help us overcome everything we face. Fill us with that good news. Fill us with that joy even as we walk out into the midst of stress in this world, fill us with the hope that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray.